Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Batchelor from Kansas and I'm the chair of National Parents Organization here in Kansas. And today I'm here with uh, Dr. Nielsen, who's a, a renowned researcher in the world of shared parenting. And we're going to talk to her a little bit uh, about her uh, research and her book that's come out. Uh, how are you, Dr. Nielsen? I'm just fine and uh, looking forward to our interview today. So you're a renowned researcher on father-daughter relationships, uh, and you've got a new book out here. And what made you want to write a book for uh, lay people involving those relationships? Well, my um, Ph.D. is in adolescent psychology, so I had been writing about adolescents, writing textbooks about adolescents for a number of years. And about 20 years ago, I had noticed there was very little research available on teenage girls' relationships with their fathers. So I thought, well, there clearly is a need here for someone to be gathering this research and writing about it for college students, but also for parents who want more information about father-daughter relationships. So I fell into it because 25 years ago, the emphasis was on mothers and daughters, mothers and sons, fathers and sons, but virtually nobody was writing about fathers and daughters. Yeah, and the book is Improving Father-Daughter Relationships, A Guide for Women and Their Dads, uh, and it's the uh, first edition here. And uh, how long did it take you to write this book? Oh, about three years. This is my fifth book on father-daughter relationships, and this particular one I wrote specifically so that fathers could read this book as well as daughters, and specifically for daughters who were in their older adolescent years, like 18, 19-year-olds, all the way through the time of the father's death. In other words, we've got 40-year-old daughters and 45-year-old daughters whose fathers are in their late 60s and 70s and 80s. Those father-daughter relationships also need help because those father-daughter relationships are still affected by the same kind of problems that they were encountering when the daughter was a late teenager. And that's really interesting. I, I've seen a lot on uh, on social media where, um, and I'm not sure if it's a trend or not, but uh, I think a lot of older, um, you know, older adults now are, are you know, trying to rebuild their relationship with their parents, uh, especially in the later years of life, right? And is, is that a trend that you've seen recently? It is for two reasons, Chris. First, with the COVID pandemic, that has made all older adult children start to think more seriously about their relationships with their older parents because the older parents have been harder hit by the pandemic. And also, the pandemic has made uh, adult daughters, many of whom have had to move home move home from college or move in together in multi-generational families. And again, when you have that close connection physically, we start thinking more about those relationships. The other thing, of course, that's happened in our country, fortunately, is fathers and mothers are living longer. So it's more likely that a daughter who's 40 or 45 years old is still going to have a father who's alive and is having some impact on her life, just as she is on his life. Yeah, and, and in reading the book, um, you know, one thing that, that I didn't really think about before, you know, uh, before I had read the book, but in, in reading it, it made me really think about how um, the relationship with your uh, parent or if you're a parent, your relationship with your with your child, you know, with your daughter, um, how that uniquely affects you. And um, I, I just I found that to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've put so much emphasis on how fathers affect their daughters, that we haven't thought enough about how the daughter affects her father. That is a two-way relationship. And if you know fathers who are divorced, especially those fathers, the relationship with their daughter has had a profound impact on the lives of these fathers. And that does not go away just because the father has passed the age of 40 or 50 or 60. 
Yeah, and and you know, as the as the father aged, does that relationship um, affect him differently? I think that as a a person ages, their relationship with their children probably is something that they think more about. Because again, the older father, an older father, is not going to be so preoccupied thinking about having to work 50 hours a week to make money for the young children. Right. There's, we have more time on our hands as we get older to think about our relationships from the past with our children. So let's say, for example, a father is 55 years old. He's no longer having to take care of his daughter financially, but he may very much be thinking about how the separation from her mother 20 years ago or 30 years ago has still had an impact, is still having an impact on his relationship with his daughter and an impact on his own life. Absolutely. So um, and just uh, to recap here, so the audience for this book uh, is mainly um, men who have daughters or daughters, you know, of course, who have fathers. Is, is there other audiences uh, that you had in mind for this book? Well, of course, the father-daughter relationship is profoundly affected by the mother, the mother's role in that family and how mothers feel about the father and daughter having a very close relationship So the other audience for this book is mothers and stepmothers who look at the the family network and mothers and stepmothers see, we've got some problems in this family network with the father-daughter relationship. So the book is also for mothers and stepmothers who would like to see uh, father-daughter relationships in the family network improve. Yeah, and the and the relationship between the the father and the daughter is not exclusive of the relationship with the mom and the daughter, right? Um, and and you know, I think one thing that I took from the book immediately was how much the mom or the stepmom can influence that father daughter relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what the research shows us is that from the time that a child is born. So from the time that that little baby girl enters the world, the mother's attitudes and the mother's behavior have a profound impact on the kind of relationship that father and daughter can create together. And that begins very, very early in the daughter's life. Some mothers are very comfortable with the father and daughter being just as close as the mother and daughter are. Other mothers are less comfortable with that idea. And so inadvertently, there are mothers who engage in something that we call gatekeeping. And gatekeeping means that the mother behaves in certain ways that she may not even be aware of. She behaves in certain ways that close the gate between the father and and the daughter, that make it more difficult for the father and daughter to create a very, very close relationship over the next 20 or 30 years of that daughter's life. So gatekeeping is a very, very important part of what happens to that father-daughter relationship in the first 18 years of that child's life. This is especially important, of course, after the parents quit living together. Mm -hmm. When they separate, then the mother's gatekeeping becomes even more important because most of the children are living with their mother. And so not only the physical access to the father, but the emotional access to the father is something that's very much in the mother's control. Yeah, and I think, uh, um, you know, a large... uh, Part of this for me is uh, seeing, you know, children who maybe didn't have access to both parents as they were growing up. And then as adults, they get to make the decision that, you know, they do want to have a relationship with both parents and, and rebuilding that um, that dialogue and that trust, I think, is uh, is a really big part of that. Okay, but again, it's very difficult when for the first 15, 20 years of your life, you have not had a close father-daughter relationship then it becomes increasingly difficult to try to rebuild 
build that relationship later in your lives. Those essential years, those first 15 to 20 years, that's the foundation for what happens from there on. That doesn't mean it's impossible to improve those relationships, but it's much, much more difficult. What would you say the general state of the father-daughter relationships are today? Well, unfortunately, what we've seen in the last two decades is that more and more and more daughters and sons are living apart from their fathers. Forty percent of all the children born in this country today are born to unmarried parents, and those parents have a very high likelihood of separating before the child is two or three years old. Of those who do marry, of the 60% of children whose parents are married when they're born, almost half of those marriages end. So we have a very, very high percentage now of children, sons and daughters, growing up in homes where their father is not present for the first 18 years of their lives. So in terms of the father-daughter relationship, it's very bad news because you're missing the physical and emotional presence of your father for a good part of your childhood. Yeah, and, and when you don't have that influence, there there are certainly, uh, I mean, that that influences your um, thoughts and feelings and decision-making all, all the way through adulthood, correct? Yes. We have, the way I like to explain it to my readers is the father has an impact on three important areas of his daughter's life. I call them the M&Ms, sort of like candy, okay, the M&Ms. As a father or as a daughter, you need to think about what impact has the father had on the M&Ms in the, in the daughter's life. The first M is money. A daughter's adult income is closely related to the kind of relationship she had with her father. Why is that? Because good father-daughter relationships lead to better grades in school, better graduation rates from high school, more likelihood to attend college, and those daughters are more likely to enter jobs that are higher-paying jobs, the STEM jobs, science, technology, engineering, and math. Strong father-daughter relationships pay off financially in the long run for daughters because they are better educated, better equipped to enter the job market, and make good incomes. So that's the first M, money. The second M, where the dad influences the daughter, is men. The daughter's relationship with men starts when she's 12, 13 years old. The men in her life then are teenage boys, but the males in her life, who she chooses to date, who she chooses to marry, how likely she is to wind up divorced, Her relationships with men, her romantic relationships, are far more closely related to the kind of relationship she has with her father than to the relationship she has with her mother. The example I like to give here is a grocery store and a hungry shopper. If a woman is hungry... I mean, she's starving. She is so hungry. She walks into the grocery store, very hungry. She's in a hurry. She doesn't have a shopping list. She's desperate to put something into her body because she's starving. What kind of food is that daughter likely to choose? She's going to choose junk food. She's going to choose the food that's in a pretty wrapper, that's the least nutritious, the highest calorie, and the worst thing for her to eat. Now, if she is not hungry and she walks into that store with a shopping list of healthy foods, 
The idea is that she's more likely to walk out with a cartload of healthy foods. Let's apply that to father hunger. Daughters who grow up hungry for a better relationship with their fathers go into the dating marketplace and they choose junk food. They choose to date and to marry men who are not good to them and who are not good for them because these daughters are searching for the love and attention and support that they did not get from their fathers. And in psychology, we refer to this as father hunger. So again, fathers who want their daughters not to pick the junk food, you need a strong father-daughter relationship starting early in the daughter's life so that she makes good choices. Well, that's a great example. That is an excellent, it's an excellent example because all women, when I tell them this, daughters are nodding their head like, yep, yep, yep. This explains why daughters who do not have good relationships with their fathers are more likely to become pregnant as teenagers, to be promiscuous, to have sex with boys to get attention, to do things sexually that they really do not want to do, to become um, sexually active too soon with too many people and the wrong choices. The third M, so we got the men, we got the money, and now we got the third M, which is mental health. A daughter's mental health is closely connected to the kind of relationship that she has with her father. By mental health, we mean Depression, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, suicide, drug and alcohol use, which is associated with your being depressed and anxious. So the daughter's mental health is very closely connected with the relationship, the quality of the relationship she has with her dad. So for all the M&Ms, money, men, Mental health. These are the three areas of the daughter's life where having a very close relationship, supportive, strong relationship with her dad is more important than the kind of relationship she has with her mom. Wow, that's so interesting. And and you I mean this isn't your opinion, right? This is what you've researched and, and found out over, over years of research. Correct. This is research. This is not personal opinion. This is not based on my personal experiences with a handful or a few hundred daughters. This is, my books are based on the available research studies that we have. So when you're going to write your book, um, I mean, obviously that's the foundation of your book. Where, where do you even start? <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's such a, it's such a, um, a massive amount of data I would imagine to go through. Mm-hmm. Well, fortunate thing for um, those of us who work at universities, the fortunate thing is that, University libraries now have this magnificent technology where an academician, a a professor, can search the databases for every single article that has ever been published in an academic journal. Those are now all online. We can search them through the use of our computer. This means I go into the databases, I type in my keywords, fathers, father, daughter, divorced father, you know, spend thousands of hours where I find those research studies, read them, make notes on them, and compile them into a book. So this is a wonderful resource that professors have uh, through our universities. So it sounds to me like you've done all the hard work here for everybody. <laughs> well, I, I think the uh, you know new students, new graduate students coming up, and uh, other people who are going to go into this profession will hopefully continue this work. But this is not uh, information that your your parents or your counselors have access to 
because they can't get access to the databases. Uh, parents and counselors and lawyers, they can use the Internet and do a Google search. That is not what you should rely on right. when you're looking for research. You have to go and read the actual studies, not what you read reported on the Internet. Absolutely. Yeah, and for the listeners out there, I mean, there is a there is a huge standard of difference between, um, you know, the Wikipedia's of the world and the things you can find on the internet versus scholarly uh, information, which has you know a certain set of standards and is often peer reviewed to make sure that it's accurate and uh, it's it's to the best of everybody's knowledge. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and well, the and um, my books and articles are again all research based peer-reviewed, and published by academic publishers. And again, that's a standard that parents, fathers, daughters, counselors, lawyers, that's a standard that we should uh, look very carefully at before we trust what we're reading and what advice we're getting from people. And what would you say about the body of research that currently exists? Are there, I mean, is there a fairly good body of research or is there are big holes in some areas? Uh, you know, where do we need to improve academically uh, when we look at father-daughter relationships? Well, researchers are still spending more time paying attention to mothers' relationships with their children, sons and daughters. Researchers have become aware of this bias that we have been biased against fathers in terms of ignoring them too much in the research on child development. So we are trying to make amends for that by including more fathers in our research studies and by focusing more seriously on the father's role in child development. You mentioned in the book some roadblocks to success, and one of those being, you know, false beliefs about men, specifically that they're less emotional and sensitive than women. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the research shows about men and empathy and, and why it's important to know, uh, know about that to be able to repair relationships? Let's go back a minute, or let's go back a couple of decades we used to believe that women were not well suited to go into careers in science and math. And people believed that, oh, there was something about a woman's brain, you know, that, that we were better equipped to write poetry and be English teachers, but that, that we had brains that were not equipped to really be great scientists or great mathematicians. That was the belief. That was a stereotype, but it was a widely held stereotype. Now, what was the impact of that? A very bad one, because little girls growing up with that stereotype and believing it would then not go and pursue jobs in those areas. The same thing happens today with the beliefs, the false beliefs, the stereotypes that we have about men as fathers. Many people believe that women have an instinct, a maternal instinct, for how to take care of children. That is not true. The research shows that is not true. There is no maternal instinct. But if you believe that, and you believe that men lack an instinct for parenting, that is not going to go well in terms of men's confidence as parents or children's willingness to believe that their fathers are instinctively or naturally just as well suited to take care of them as their mothers are. A second damaging belief is that men are not as empathic, men are not as communicative, men are not as sensitive, men are not as open and sharing as women. We have three decades of research showing that that is not true. Men and women have similar styles of communication. Men are just as empathic as women. Men's feelings are, are hurt in the same way women's feelings are. There are more differences between women and more differences between men in those regards than there are between men and women. But if children grow up believing 
the stereotype that their dads aren't interested in these personal things because dads aren't empathetic. Dads aren't sympathetic. Dads aren't into feelings the way moms are. That is a huge roadblock and a great disservice to children and to their fathers. In the same way, it was a tremendous disservice and roadblock for us to have little girls believing that women's brains aren't suited to doing math and science. How, how far would you say we've come in this journey here to to uh, find um, a path of equality for you know fathers in, in this regard? Clearly not far enough. One example would be to look at our child custody laws. Child custody laws are still not prioritizing the importance of fathering time because child custody laws are often based on some of these myths and stereotypes about men as parents. And as long as those myths are out there, they are going to have an impact on policies such as custody laws. The idea, for example, in custody laws, the idea that young children, infants, preschoolers, toddlers, the idea that they need to be with their mommies because there's this special thing between mommies and young kids and that they don't need their fathers as much at that time in their lives. This is not supported by the research. This is a myth. This is a stereotype. But that myth and that stereotype still underlies most child custody laws. So it's having a very real impact and a negative one in terms of children being deprived of their father's time and care after the parents separate. So, or another example of that is look at the commercials that are on television. Look at the commercials. Look at the way that fathers are portrayed. If you look at them, and you may find yourself laughing, But would you really find that funny if it was reversed and that commercial was making fun of mothers instead of fathers? Yeah, the double standard in our society is certainly uh, very strong. And and I've done some research myself and some of the work that I've done. It shows that from the 70s, there's been a strong increase in uh, this this sort of, uh, you know, dad being the the pit of all the jokes and, and being the easy easy target. Right. Um, and that's, I think because, um, at least in the commercial world, um, you know, household decisions are are made primarily by the moms and, and, and women. And, and so that's where the advertising world uh, tends to focus their time. And they, they try and of course sell to that demographic. Right. But again, let's go back 20 years, 30 years, 20 or 30 years ago, you would see commercials on television about members of minority groups, oh, it was considered very funny. Or you would see sitcoms on TV about minority groups where people with brown and black skin were being made fun of, and we thought it was funny. We do not think that is funny 30 years later because we understand that you are feeding a stereotype that has a damaging impact. The same is true that we need to evolve to this place where we will see this is not funny. Let me give you a very specific example. In Britain, in Britain, two years ago, they passed guidelines for the advertising industry saying you may not create commercials and advertising that portrays men in these negative ways, or that portrays women in those negative ways in terms of sexist stereotypes. Mm -hmm. It's not funny. I don't care if you're trying to sell a product. (laughs) I don't care who you're trying to make laugh. It is not funny, because the impact is very serious. The impact of making fun of green people is that it has a negative impact on how we feel about green people. 
the impact of constantly making sitcoms and commercials that portray fathers as foolish and childlike and in need of guidance from mothers, that has an impact on how children see their fathers, and it has an impact on how fathers see themselves. I, that's interesting. I didn't know that about about Britain. What would you say are, are um, I mean, change in the United States uh, on this front? Uh, to me, um, it seems it seems like it's happening, but it's it's very slow. Um, you know, what, what what are some of the things that you would like to see? Well, obviously, those of us who uh, believe children need their fathers as much as their mothers, which is what the research tells us not a matter of opinion, that's research. We would like to see uh, shared parenting laws in custody. Uh, Arizona, Kentucky are among two of the states that have these uh, father, mother friendly laws where fathers are being um, allowed finally to have the parenting time that they want with their children. So that would be one way to go, clearly. I believe there are now 20 states who are looking at revising their custody laws. Mm -hmm. And in those states, we are trying to get the research, we are trying to get the research across to the people who are making those decisions about revising custody laws. So that certainly is a big place to start. The other, obviously, is in commercials and advertising to follow the lead of the British people and and let's eliminate this kind of um, advertising that that creates damaging stereotypes. Um, Another area would be to try to help mothers understand how they might be contributing accidentally, unintentionally, that you might be contributing to this um, sense that your children have that dad is not as good as mom at parenting. So so those are three pieces uh, of that puzzle that would help move us along. So you had a section in the book that talked about how moms uh, may be harming the father-daughter relationships. And we talked a little bit about, you know, why that's important. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what are some things that moms can do uh, or or women in general can do to be more, you know, male or father friendly uh, with their daughters? Mm -hmm. Well, let's just look at three real simple, immediate steps that moms could take and stepmoms also. The first step is step back, step back, (laughs) leave the father and daughter alone, let them have plenty of time together, stop intervening, stop supervising, stop being there. Let the father and daughter have time alone. Go away for a weekend. Leave the father and daughter alone for the weekend. Go away for uh, an evening without feeling you need to be there to supervise and give advice to how the father needs to manage this relationship with his daughter. So the first piece of advice I give mothers and stepmothers is leave the father and daughter alone. Give them time together without you being there. That extends to emails and phone calls. For older daughters, mom, get off the phone. Get off the phone. Let the mother do something else while the father and daughter, let them text and email and phone calls without your needing to be a part of it. They can do this on their own. Don't treat the father like he is a child who needs you to tell him how to interact with his daughter. So that is the first step. And the second would be to make very clear verbally to the father in front of the daughter how important you think that relationship is and how valuable you think it is. Say it to them. Let them see it in, in, in your behavior and in your words. And for daughters, what I say is you need to reach out to your fathers. 
in emails, in phone calls, in time together, and invite him to do things with you without your mother or your stepmother or any other siblings present. That's some great advice. And and I would imagine, um, you know, just hearing you describe it like that, um, you know, particularly for families that are still intact, um, I, I would imagine that the mom and the dad's relationship would improve um, when the mom sort of steps away and, and doesn't make the dad feel, um, you know, so much anxiety over this relationship or so much like they're a child. Well, we would hope so. I don't know what the research <laughs> says on that, but, um, you know, so, I mean... To be clear, when I have daughters in my class say, oh, no, 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 that's not, my mom has always been supportive of my relationship with my daughter. When I have women email me and mothers email, oh, I've always been supportive of the relationship, then I would ask you this question. If you're a mother or a stepmother, how would you feel if tonight your daughter called her dad and wanted to talk to her dad for an hour on the phone about a problem she's having with her boyfriend or a problem she's having with her husband or a problem she's having with a close girlfriend, how would you feel about that? Would you feel you have to pick up the phone and join in? Would you feel jealous? Would you feel hurt? And there are a lot of very loving, well-meaning mothers who would not feel very comfortable with that. They would feel hurt. They would feel jealous. Mm -hmm. Now, if you said, oh, well, they talked for an hour about politics, or they talked for an hour about uh, money and grades and how to fix the car, oh, well, fine, who cares? I'm talking about the personal stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of mothers do have a degree of insecurity and jealousy about the father and daughter having that kind of close relationship. Yeah. And that's a much deeper, um, you know, level than just talking about politics or, or how to fix something. Right. Of course. And, and one of the most surprising things, Chris, that I've learned from decades of reading this research, one of the saddest and most surprising things for me is the research is telling us daughters often say they love their fathers as much as they love their mothers. But even at the time he dies, daughters say, I did not know my father anywhere nearly as well as I got to know my mother because everything stayed at that very superficial level. That is painful. And that is sad, and that is distressing. Absolutely, and it, and as we talked before, I mean that that sort of a relationship uh, influences the daughter in in so many ways, from you know the the people that she dates to the financial decisions she makes to you know mm-hmm. how successful she is in life. And um, I think often we don't really uh, put it in that context. True. We talked a little bit about shared parenting, and, and the research that you've done uh, shows that shared parenting works, and it's it's an important thing. And uh, we talked a little bit about how the laws are are slowly uh, starting to change across the country. But what's the what's the long term hope for you with father daughter relationships, and you know, in this country, and you know, how do you how do you hope that they change? How do you hope that the book will will influence that, and uh, and where do we go from here? Mm. Well, I hope my books will help fathers and daughters uh, find very specific ways that they can strengthen their relationships, very, very specific ways that they can, at any age, start making a a more meaningful, a more personal relationship. So I certainly would hope that, that more fathers and daughters, by the time he dies, can say, you know, we followed some of the advice in Nielsen's books, and it did bring us closer together, and that's a good thing. My second hope, of course, would be through changing legislation and commercials and children's books and all of these things that feed our negative stereotypes would be that through those changes, children will see their fathers in more realistic more open ways 
so that it will enrich the relationship for both of them. Well, Dr. Nielsen, thank you so much for visiting with us and talking with us about uh, father-daughter relationships. And uh, we look forward to uh, everyone reading your book. I know I've, I've uh, almost all the way through it now, and it's it's got a lot of great information. Uh, that book is Improving Father-Daughter Relationships, a guide for women and their dads. And, uh, and there's also, Chris, there is a, I have a website with extensive resources on it for fathers and daughters. Fantastic. What's that website? That is just Linda Nielsen at Wake Forest University. And there are many, many, many resources there for free for fathers and for daughters. Awesome. And so, yeah, we'll link to that uh, website in the notes here. Um, and, um, and is there any other uh, information you want to tell the folks out there? Take heart. Move forward. Don't listen to the negative stereotypes. Don't read the research off the Internet and um, strengthen those relationships no matter what your age. Well, Dr. Nielsen, thank you so much for joining us today, and we really appreciate all the work that you've done, uh, you know, specifically on this topic of father-daughter relationships and and bringing uh, all this information to light and, uh, you know, the hours of research that you've put in. We we really appreciate that, and we look forward to everybody getting a copy of your book, Improving Father-Daughter Relationships, A Guide for Women and Their Dads. Uh, You can find that on Amazon or wherever you find your books. Uh, And, of course, don't forget to go visit Dr. Nielsen's website. Uh, We'll put a link in the notes here. Let us know what questions you have. We'd love to hear from you in the comments on this. Uh, Tell us what you think or what your experience has been or maybe what some of the issues that you've had. Uh, Let's get that conversation going.